it's something that I'm trying to figure out as to whether public school is a good thing or private schools are good things, where funding should be going, whether parents should be able to choose which school their kids go to, whether they sh whether kids should have to go to the the school within their immediate area. I'm I'm not sure. I love I love an inside perspective as to what you think. I think that funding thing is such a myth. I mean, with our, like us getting the budget, like we were, like I was reading our email from the division. I think it said that SPS to like Saskatoon public was $8 million in the hole mm -hmm. just because of the pandemic. And I was like, wow, I was like, that's crazy. And then with the Saskatchewan government slashing the budget as well. So I think it's such a myth. And I think as a young teacher, I'm still kind of like learning like, all right, where does money go in education? What can I learn about it? And then, I think there needs to be more funding within testing and getting kids testing in school, especially at early age, getting that testing for maybe autism spectrum or any other um, academic, except, like, academic exceptionalities with, within students. I think that's something that needs to be so, there needs to be so much funding in that. Because if, if we can get the funding for the testing, we can get the funding for the educational support for these students to have success in the classroom. And I think that's something that we, is really struggling in Saskatchewan and what I've seen. And then especially now, I think there's such a stigma around testing a student. It's like, all right, let's test. Like we want to test this student for um, like autism spectrum. And they go, oh, no. And they'll pull the kid from that school and go to a different school. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why does that happen? It's, I think it's just a stigma. It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't think parents, I'm not, I'm not, I can only, I can't like generalize, but it's like parents don't want that stigma of, oh, my child has a learning exceptionality. It's like, oh, I don't want like my student having the label that they're on the spectrum or maybe my student is um, like, there's so many, there's a list that goes on, but okay. I don't like parents don't want that stigma. Okay. I want to, I want to try to steel man that perspective because I think that's how we get closer to understanding this a little bit better. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to steel man that yeah. by telling a kid that they have something or are something that can create a feedback loop of self-fulfilling prophecy where exactly. so, so if you tell a kid that he has ADHD, then that becomes an excuse for anything. And I've, I've seen that happen a lot. I was diagnosed with ADHD as a kid and I'm very thankful that my dad didn't let me get on to meds. That, that's something that I'm really glad didn't happen. And so that, that's something that can happen is if yeah. standardized testing becomes a thing, kids are put into boxes and if they're put into boxes, then that's how they label themselves. And yeah. parents don't want, that label to be the way that kids see themselves for the rest of their lives. And that can even be a detriment. So something like ADHD by medicating a kid with ADHD, the way that, so it actually inhibits prefrontal cortex development later on in life. Yeah. So I think that a part of that is the brain becomes a muscle over time or the brain is, it's our most complex muscle, the most complex machinery in the, in the universe that we understand so far that we don't understand at all, but it's the most complex thing that we don't understand. And what happens over time is if you are forced into doing something, then that's going to end up building neural connections around that activity. So if there's a drug that gets introduced that gives kids the ability to focus on one thing at a time, because I think that's what Ritalin and a lot of the, the treatments for ADHD, that's what they're poised to do is to allow kids to focus. So what happens when kids are able to focus under that substance is they no longer are under the stress to develop that naturally. And then they yeah. become, and then they become not addicted, but it becomes a necessity to have that, that substance. It becomes a dependent. Right, exactly. exactly. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. So, so that, that's my steel man of that perspective. I like that. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, that's the case. Like, it's it, it's a thing that we talk about earlier. It becomes a crutch. We're like, oh, is that a kid's like, oh, I can't do this because of my ADD. I can't do this because of my ADHD. Yeah. But I think that's the biggest thing as well. Is like, we as teachers are the only ones that know that. I think that other students don't know that. Nobody else knows that. It's just us and the parent and the per and the like the our, our our team's person who is in charge of testing within the school. Does the child get informed? Um, I, it's one thing I do not know. Okay. But. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think the biggest thing is if we can get that testing and get the funding for the testing, we can have that kid just get like maybe EA support or mm -hmm. maybe the use of a hokey stool. It's like a rock, those little rocking chairs with those kids or like those little those little rocking stools. Yeah. 
or even like a different desk, like just we can, ways we can adapt and modify so the student can have academic success. But I think as well as like, like I'm, kids nowadays I've seen in teaching are just so empathetic and caring and like it's, it's such a, it's such a change and from when I was in school, like people were dicks. Like, we went to, I went to school with some dicks. We, like we were dicks as kids. It's just like, oh, this person's doing this. They're talking out loud. They're flirting. Oh, this person has a fidget toy. And now it's like every kid has a fidget toy. Everyone, someone has, has a fidget spinner. Someone, a lot of my kids have bulky stools. A lot of my kids have little like those hip therabands used to warm up tied around the bottom of the desk just to play their feet, just something to help them regulate. And, like I think that's this thing now. It's like kids and education is so adaptive and changing is that are so adaptive to these new practices to help these kids regulate and be successful in the classroom as, as with their peers and like all these other facets of their life. Okay, so that's another, that's a, the other side of the perspective is that yeah. by giving these tests to kids and understanding what can better help the kids to succeed, the teachers are then able to tailor an environment as well as allocate the proper funding towards that classroom and towards that student, which will build a better environment for the kids so example if you have so just as you said kids with adhd yeah. then you you're able to give kids you're able to change the environment slightly by giving them yeah some kind of some kind of fidget toy some kind of uh like the stool you were talking about i actually haven't seen those but that's interesting they're so cool these things they're freaking fun i sometimes get bored and i sit there and i kind of just like roll around that's i'll have to send you a picture but they're sweet yeah but, but that's but that's very interesting because then you can also tailor I, I think what would help with kids is especially young boys have a really difficult time sitting still oh yeah young, young boys a, are uh, hyper uh, overdose with adhd yeah and so i think that being able to give kids an environment where they're able to run around there's a a cool study that looked at the brains of rats and the three categories of rats were rats raised in isolation, rats raised in an environment with socialization and toys within a controlled environment, and then wild rats. And yeah. the brains of the wild rats were so much more developed than either of the other two. And even the brain of the rat that was in an environment where it could play and socialize was far more developed than the rat that was isolated. So each rat, each step, the rat's brain was far more developed. And so I think that's a, a potential clue as to how we could be looking at the long-term success of children and kind of how I was talking earlier about how we haven't been testing different, yeah. different learning or different teaching methods for kids. Yeah. You, you could take six different schools and run 60 different experiments with different classes by cohort, by age, by year, and over time find the best way to deal with certain kids with their different ailments or their, uh, the way that they test and finding what works best for ADHD kids, what works best for yeah. autistic kids. And you could learn, you could, you could just run these huge experiments and in 10 years, it would actually probably be would it be 13 years because kindergarten to grade 12, then you could understand this, this intervention worked the best. Now we're going to standardize this. Whereas, as I said earlier, we've kind of landed on, well, this, this worked well enough for now. So now this is our go-to. It's, it's, it's almost archaic. It's like, Oh, this is how dad did it. This is how mm -hmm. grandpa did it. it worked out well so far. Yeah. It's exactly the way I think about it. But I think I'm even too, like just giving three, like, three different methods i was i you could even do it in the sense of like all right i'm going to give three different teachers the same science experiment i'm going to give them no instruction i'm going to give them just the materials how are they going to like how are they going to plan it how are they going to instruct it how are they going to make this engaging for the students go mm -hmm. and just see how three different teachers instruct and how three different levels of academic success are in the classroom this teacher might be lethargic and just, just simple like simple drill and practice this one teacher might get really hands-on and allow the kids to maybe work in alternate spaces, maybe take the experiment outside, just use all like just alternative learning environments. And the one teacher might be just like doing different things, putting kids in different groups and then like just really effectively using the space around them. So I think that's something and especially in education, like I think if you said like kids that like boys, especially young age, Nick, they need to move. I was hundred percent that kid. It's like, I could not sit still to save my life. 
proud like I did the diagnostic testing for ADHD like my parents like we've done the test on him like he's fine like he's just a grade five boy he needs to move Mm -hmm. and then that's the thing it's like biggest thing now especially now in education we see is body breaks it's like all right kids we've I've talked to you for two hours. Let's go outside for a 20 minute body break. We're going to go on the playground, go freaking nuts, burn out your energy, get it all out of you. And then we'll come back. We'll ease back into people, we'll ease back into instruction. We'll go. And that's mm-hmm. something I found that they started preaching. Them. Like my mom did as a, as a teacher, and I've watched it and I saw other teachers do it and I saw it in their lesson plans. And then in the, especially when I was learning in university, it was like, this is something they really hammered home. And it's something I found that's super effective for both genders and, especially in the classroom and like these kids love it. They're like, Oh, sick. We get body break between this period. And they just go out and they go nuts. I'm like, I'm not I'm like, I'm not even gonna play a game. I'm gonna let you guys just go absolutely like ape shit, go nuts. And then they come back and they're like dialed in. I'm like, all right, sick. I'm going to sit here, give you instruction. And they just knock it out of the park. 